Hey everyone! Today we're going to be talking about this pair of Klipsch KG4 speakers. I found these things on the side of the road last year, completely abandoned. Now they're in rough shape. They uh, had mold on them. They must have been in somebody's basement. One of the grills was all ripped up, missing a badge. One of the woofer dust caps was punched in. The woofers don't match. Cabinets are a little beat. But hey, they were free and they work. So it got me thinking, could I take these cabinets and buy up them with my Sonos Symphonic speakers? Now I did this in an earlier video with a much smaller pair of speakers and I was curious, could the Symphonic power a big speaker like this? So let's take a look back at what these KG4s even are. This is them in better days in a much nicer setup. And the KG4s came out in 85 and they were made for a number of years. And the cool thing about most of the KG series is that they're a two-way system. And that's really critical for this because we need just a two-way system because that's what the Symphonic is. And taking a little closer look here, the KG4s have a compression horn and then they have two 8-inch polypropylene woofers. And on the back, there's a large 12-inch passive radiator. So a two-way system, but uh, this should have a lot of bump. And if you look at the sensitivity, that's really cool. That's a 94 dB sensitivity. And the Symphonic speakers are probably in the high 80s. So I'm thinking that these speakers, even though they're large, probably only need about a quarter of the power to make the equivalent amount of sound. Because every 3 dB in difference requires twice as much power. And the overall frequency response looks pretty solid with extension all the way down to 38 hertz, which is impressive. I had to track down some other information though. The things that I really care about is the crossover frequency and I found it in this other article. So the crossover is 1800 Hertz. And what I understand about the Symphonic is it seems like it's much closer to 3000 Hertz. I don't really know the exact number. So the crossover here will be fine for the tweeter, but it might be a little outside of the range of the woofer. So that is something to look out for. And the third and final thing to keep an eye out for is whether or not the load that this presents to the amplifiers in the Symphonic are going to be too low because that will pull too much current. Uh, fortunately, I found this article that has pretty detailed measurements on the impedance of the woofers especially. And uh, they hit 4 ohms between 150 and 300 hertz, which is fairly high. And then the impedance actually increases as you get lower. So my hunch is that this will be no problem as far as driving, especially coupled with the high efficiency. But before I got too excited, I figured I'd do a test run. So I took off the binding posts and the 12 inch passive radiator on the back of the cabinets to get a look inside. I can see the two woofers and the tweeter. The crossover itself is mounted onto the back of the binding posts. And you know, it's nothing special. It's got some low quality capacitors, an iron core inductor, not so great. But luckily in our case, we don't need passive crossovers anymore. We're biamping. So what I can do is just simply disconnect the terminals from the passive crossover that go to the woofer and the tweeter and we just want to completely bypass those with a wire so i just attach some wires to the tweeter and i attach some wires to the woofers and i left the jumper between the two woofers because i want those in parallel and we just need an airtight way of getting those two wires out of the cabinet and hooked into our symphonics so what I did as a quick test, don't make fun of my craftsmanship here, I just took the existing binding posts, I cut out a circle in foam core, that's the exact same dimensions as the existing cup, I drilled the four screw holes to line up, and then I literally just poked the wires right through the foam core and used a ton of hot glue to make sure that it's as airtight as possible. And before I get a million comments, about the quality of this thing. This is just a test. Uh, all I wanted to do is test whether or not biamping it was worth it and I wanted to do it in a non-destructive way. Uh, the important thing here is that it's airtight and it definitely is airtight, I confirm that. So once this was done, all that was left to do was lug these things back up to my office uh, and hook them up and see how they sounded. So what I did is just to remind you on the process, on the back of the Symphonics, I have a pair of binding posts. Uh, there's the top ones that just 
directly hook up to the tweeter amp, the bottom one to the woofer amp, and I have those switches to shut off the internal drivers. So now I'm really just using this as a set of amplifiers with a built-in electronic crossover. And then I just ran a wire from those to the little wires sticking out of the back of the speaker and used some wire nuts to hook it all up. In the app, I set these up as a stereo pair, gave them the name that I liked, and uh, the first thing you need to do is run true play. That's super important because out of the box, these will be tuned for the default symphonic sound and they will sound terrible with any other speakers. And to get these dialed in, I had to do a lot of trial and error. Uh, so essentially I would set up the speakers in a certain position. I'd run true play. I'd do a bunch of listening. I would move them, run true play rinse and repeat. Uh, what I found is I like these about a foot from the back wall, uh, towed in a little bit, which means angled in towards me, not completely so that they intersect at my head, but just a little bit. And um, the other trick that I found, and this rings true with what happened with the subwoofer testing as well, is that I found that it was best if I would run true play with the speakers about a foot further forward than I wanted to listen to them at, run true play, and then I'd put them back. And what that would do is it would reduce just a little bit of the high end, which was nice with these, and it wouldn't reduce the low end too much. So these are really bassy speakers and TruePlay sometimes will say, whoa, 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 that's too much bass. And you know I like bass. And while I had these things apart, I also took the liberty of swapping the woofers around. So now the top woofer is the white polypropylene one and the bottom woofer is the black one. So they don't match, but at least now they're symmetrical. So, hey, that's okay. And just so you know, the black woofers are replacement woofers uh, from Klipsch. So they are official, but must have been that the person that had these before blew those woofers. So once I got these all dialed in and I started doing some serious listening, wow, I was so impressed by these things. They have such a dynamic, big sound. It's amazing. There's a great amount of separation, a lot of depth in the sound stage. And you can just pick out all the instruments. I feel like you can walk into there and look around. And considering they're horn tweeters, they actually are very, very smooth. Um, they get a little harsh as you turn them up really loud. Uh, but I think the new diaphragms that I've ordered will take care of that. And the thing I really love about these is the low end. You don't even need a sub with these things. Um, there's a lot of energy around 40 or 50 hertz, and it just gives it that really rich, punchy sound that I've always been looking for. It reminds me of the JBL L100s, like that great 70s, 80s kind of sound. And I would say they're pretty mellow in the mid-range. Um, because they're a two-way and we're dealing with a woofer that's going all the way up to about 3,000 hertz, you know, the, the mids aren't super forward, which I kind of like. I like the sound of this. It feels very integrated. So to my ears, these sounded good, but how do they measure? So I threw on some pink noise and opened my Spectrum Analyzer app on my phone. And you can see these things are pretty much ruler flat across the entire frequency spectrum here. Uh, there's really usable bass all the way down to 20 or 30 hertz here. This thing barely rolls off. Uh, so really, really happy with that. And I didn't really have to mess at all with the EQ. I would usually leave that alone. The only time I would do anything is if I turn it up pretty loud, sometimes the horns got a little too forward for my taste. Um, and so I would just notch it down by one slot here and everything sounded great. And the efficiency of these clip speakers, I think is really where the magic happens. I think it gives it that really dynamic sound. And if you look at the Sonos app here, it's at 50%. And I'm getting about 86 decibels of sound out of this at 50%. And since these speakers have an efficiency of 93 dB with one watt of input, you can calculate how much power is generally being used right now. So each 3 dB requires a half or a double amount of power, depending on if you're going up or down. So because we're about 6 dB down, you take that one watt, divide it in half and divide it in half again. So we're only using about a quarter of a watt, which is kind of crazy. One small side effect of these really efficient speakers that I noticed is that the loudness toggle in the application does a lot more when you flip it on and off. It's just a much more noticeable effect. And I think the reason for that is the loudness is calibrated against a much lower efficiency speaker. And the loudness curves essentially are meant to fix the fact that our ears don't hear bass and treble as 
much as mid frequencies when the sound is quieter. So essentially at low volumes, it boosts up the bass and treble. And as you turn the volume up, that effect is reduced. So because our speakers are much louder than Sonos thinks they are, it just makes this effect a lot more noticeable. So when listening at low volumes, I still like the loudness circuit to be on. However, I was finding myself turning the bass down by a notch or two, which is pretty surprising for me. Uh, as I turned it up to about 50%, uh, I actually found that the loudness was better off with everything flat. So I was really, really impressed with the way everything sounded by amped with TruePlay, but I wanted to go back to the passive crossovers and do a little bit of an A-B comparison. So the way I did that is I actually just took the tweeter outputs from the passive crossover and wired those right into the tweeter inputs on the back of the speaker. And I did the same for the woofer. And so that allows me to basically hook the crossover up outside of the speaker. And then in order to get a signal into the passive crossover, I just plugged the speaker wires right out of the back of the amp and plug them into the binding post here. So that's generally how I had it set up. And my hunch here is that this might sound a little bit better because the passive crossover has a lower crossover point of 1800 Hertz. And you'll remember that on the Sonos biamp setup, that crossover point is pushed up quite a bit. And that just means that the woofer might be struggling a bit to hit those higher frequencies and might be breaking up so I listened to this for a day or two with the passive crossovers and the mid range was a teeny tiny bit better. However, I felt that the overall sound wasn't as good. It wasn't as exciting. The low end wasn't as good. There wasn't quite as much sparkle. And the other thing is there was a certain boxiness to the sound. And I think that's because there's a little bit too much energy uh, in the mid bass region. And so this is the frequency response curve that I measured by putting pink noise through it. And you can see it's actually quite flat, but you do see a couple peaks here uh, and it rolls off quite a bit on the high end and the low end. And it just overall doesn't have as much impact. And uh, so if we take that same exact speaker in the same exact position, but by amp it and then apply room correction through TruePlay, this is the comparison. So the darker curve you see here is the biamped version. And there's just a massive difference in terms of the low end. Uh, there's extension all the way down to 20 or 30 hertz like we saw earlier. Uh, so it just gives it so much more presence. All right, so as one final little sanity check, I thought I would just compare these uh, biamped clip speakers against my reference system, which is a pair of Kef LS50s and a Peachtree Audio amplifier. So this is a fairly expensive setup. Um, and they're very different speakers, so it's hard to just completely compare them head to head. Uh, the Kef are a lot smoother. The mid-range is really, really nice. Uh, but honestly, they just don't have quite as big of a soundstage. They're not as compelling as I find these clip speakers to be. So, you know, I'm kind of shocked. And since these things sound so good, I'm going to be taking them apart and uh, updating the insides as much as possible to even improve them further. And uh, I'll do a video on that as well. So I would definitely encourage you, keep your eyes peeled on Craigslist. You can pick up a pair of any of these KG line clip speakers uh, for really, really cheap. The uh, 2.5 here is a, probably a perfect choice for this application. Uh, really just try to stick with a two-way that has a woofer that's eight inches or smaller because of the crossover point. And yeah, just have fun. I mean, I think it's pretty amazing that you can get a bi-amp system with built-in room correction for basically a hundred bucks. So uh, yeah, go forth and hack. Uh, I'll be doing more videos on the topic, so be sure to subscribe and thanks for watching.